Hello, once again, welcome. This is a Disability Law Show. I'm John Scholes. He is Savan Tamarkin, reaching out to Savan, a member of his team. Anytime, I'll give you that contact information. Plus, it pops up on the screen all the time, one 855 821-5900. You got help at disabilityrights.ca and just disabilityrights.ca will take you to the firm website. Lots of information and contact there as well. Plus there's links to our long running radio show. So you want to listen to an hour version of what we do here in 30 minutes. You can do that anytime you like and there's always a fresh content up there as well. Chronic pain and disability claims. We're covering all that on the show today but many more things to get through. Savannah, some emails. We'll go to mydisabilityquestions.com for reference as well. But we always start the show with something that's happening on your side of the of the legal fence. What do you got going on today? John, I want to tell you about a success story. This is a, cool. uh, a, a case that I had resolved this past week, uh, and it involved a, a lady who is uh, uh, in her early 30s. She's a mother, uh, mother of two. Uh, I was contacted initially by her mother, actually, who is a, a, a supporter of our show, a viewer of our show, but been watching our show for, for probably a few years now. And she had contacted me, this was late last year, about her daughter who was uh, denied long-term disability. Now, her daughter is a dental hygienist. And uh, what happened was that she suffers from mental health issues, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, you know, the, the whole gamut of things that right now, you know, many people because of COVID, you know, they're suffering. Uh, but in addition to that, she suffers from chronic pain, chronic back pain. And, you know, and as a dental hygienist, this is a big problem. And she had applied for long-term disability. She had coverage through work to her health benefits provider. And she was denied LTD. And she was denied three times. So she had appealed. So she was denied the first time. And then she had appealed twice. And both times she got rejected by the insurance company. And so a year goes by. This lady who's now been denied her LTD three times essentially gave up. And so her mother calls me up, explains the situation to me, and says, you know, can you speak with my daughter? And I said, of course, absolutely I can speak with her. And, and so I ended up connecting with her daughter, and this was, again, late last year. And I, I looked at the medical documentation she's given the insurance company from her psychotherapist, uh, from her family doctor, from her chronic pain doctor, everyone who basically said, no, this lady needs time off. She's not, she's not able to function at work. Uh, and, and this predated COVID at that point. I mean, now it's even worse. Long story short, I started the legal claim. Uh, this was earlier this year. And, uh, you know, we are now, what, several months post, the claim has been resolved and it's been resolved for six figures. Now, I can't wow. give you too much information. There's confidentiality provisions in the release that she had signed. This is a very common uh, a type of a claim that we deal with at the firm. I can tell you right now, John, that this lady, uh, had she simply given up uh, on the claim and her mother would not have contacted me, this lady would have been out of pocket a lot of money. I mean, again, I can't tell you how much, but six figure worth of money that is now going to go to her and her family. And so what's the lesson here? There are two things. There are two takeaways here. Number one, if the insurance company denies your long-term disability claim, or if you know someone that is in that position, that the insurance company wrongfully denied your claim, don't sit out. Don't walk away from that claim if you are still disabled or if you know somebody who's still disabled and has been denied that claim. That's number one. You have to stand for your rights. Come to us. At the very least, let us explain to you what your rights are. We'll tell you if you have a case or not. I've had my share of situations, John, conversations where I told someone, listen, the insurance company is actually correct. You cannot go after them. They are right to deny your claim. But more often than not, people know when they're disabled. They know when the insurance company has been unjust in their decision-making process. And so when we look at the documentation, we make an objective uh, um, assessment, and we tell you if there's a case. So that's number one. Don't walk away from your rights. Number two, don't play the insurance company's appeal game. I keep saying this time and time again. People get denied long-term disability or they get cut off long-term disability, and they appeal those decisions. Listen, those appeals are useless. I know insurance companies are going to say, but wait a second, Sivan, some of them do work. We have reversed some of these uh, uh, decisions to, to stop benefits or to, or to deny benefits on appeal. How many times, I ask them, show me the statistics. How many times have you denied claims and then on appeal reversed your position? They've never given me statistics on this. In fact, every time I've asked, they say, we don't have statistics for that. Mm. That's that's bull. You really think insurance companies don't keep statistics on that kind of stuff? Of course yeah. they do. I can't imagine that they don't. My point is this. These appeals, when you appeal these decisions, you're not appealing to a third party. You're not appealing to a judge. You're not appealing to somebody who can force the insurance company to reverse course. You're appealing to the same people who denied you in the first place. That's why it's useless. 
They have nothing that is holding, you know, holding anything over their head. They don't care. For them to simply deny you again and again and again, it's just a stroke of a pen. Whereas what we do is we start a legal claim against them. We force them through a legal process, and they understand that at some point, if they don't relent and they don't actually pay our clients what they're owed, they're going to end up before a judge. And what do you think a judge is going to do when the judge hears from your doctors that you're disabled and the insurance company denied your claim? The judge is going to force the insurance company to pay you. That's what we're here. They know this. They're simply playing a numbers game. They know that many people will walk away. So anyways, John, I know I've taken a lot of time here, but I really want to force those two issues, those two lessons. Do not walk away from your rights and don't go through the appeals process. Contact us and we can tell you what your options are, and then you will be empowered to make the right decision. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think another part of that, uh, that particular case you were talking about was a six-figure settlement. People, oh, that sounds really inflated. This is money owed you. This is not a windfall or a lottery ticket, right? They got to remember that. Yep, you have to remember this. I, I've had cases where, you know, I've settled claims and my client got 50000 in their pocket. I had claims where my clients got half a million in their pocket and more. This is money. When the insurance company pays you that, there's no scamming here. They're paying you this because they understand that if they don't pay you this now, we're going to make sure that a judge orders them to pay you. So they're not being, you know, charitable here. You know, and you're not doing anything wrong. You're simply standing up for your rights. Insurance companies would love it if you did not stand up for your rights, if you walked away from your rights. In fact, their whole paradigm is based on this, on the idea that most people will walk away, will be intimidated by them. Do not be intimidated by them. And I'm talking to somebody who used to defend insurance companies. They used to be a defense lawyer for insurance companies. It is a game that they're playing with you. Now, sometimes they are correct to deny claims, but more often than not, when I talk to claimants who are disabled, it's obvious on its face that the insurance company has done something wrong here. You just have to have the guts to stand up and to contact us so we can tell you what to do next. Another website for you anytime, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Don't be fooled by the word employment, even though that's the other half of what your firm does. But there's a robust section on disability law there as well, isn't there? Yeah, if, if you want to get really quick answers, you don't want to call us, you don't want to go uh, email right. us, you just want answers, don't go to Dr. Google. Go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. You'll get your questions answered on both employment law matters, if you're an employer and you're having issues with your employer, or if you have a long-term disability issue. Again, that website is customizable. If you put in the information that it's asking you to, to explain your situation, I'm not talking about your name, your number, any of that. Okay, it's anonymous. Give whatever information you need to give to, to be able to get the answers you need, and, and that website will give you the answers you need within a matter of seconds. And if at that point you want to contact us, there is a button there at the bottom that says contact ST Law, and we'll contact you and we'll speak with you about your situation. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to contact us, close the browser. We won't even know that you were there, but at least you have a place here to go you know, for answers, for accurate and quick answers about your employment law questions and your long-term disability questions. And anytime, 1-855-821-5900 is the other way to reach out, and disabilityrights.ca. That would be uh, the, the uh, firm website, rather, you go to and find links to our radio show. And we take a lot of phone calls on the show. As you know, Savannah, you answer a ton of people who call in across the country. We want to get to our first phone call from our radio show and talk about it right here. I have depression and anxiety. The insurance, I got, got COVID. The insurance denied my policy and said I have to appeal. Where I got the COVID from is from my work. So I'm not sure what should I do if I should. Just the thought of me going back to work is just like, like my anxiety. It's just like I'm getting very right. nervous and, and, you know. The, the appeal word again, the old appeal. The, the appeal word, and of course, mix it in with COVID and you have a recipe for disaster, right? And again, yeah. this idea that you've been denied now your long-term disability, the insurance company doesn't care, doesn't listen. Again, this is where we step in. And, and, and John, it's very tough to, to just provide advice that is a one-size-fits-all because there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to legal cases. Mm -hmm. Every case is unique on its facts. We try to give people here some general information, and sometimes we have these kinds of voicemails and we have emails, and we can really you know, focus and, and hone in on a particular question. And in this lady's case, look, the insurance company has denied the claim, and they're telling her to appeal, or she's thinking about appealing, and I tell people, do not appeal these long-term disability denials. They will lead you nowhere. You'll go around in circles, only to be frustrated and eventually, potentially, walk away from your rights, thinking that there's nothing you can do. You're giving the insurance company everything they requested, and they still denied your claim. And so people say, well, Sivan, what can you do that I haven't done? I'll tell you what I can do. 
I can start that legal process. That legal process, that legal claim that we serve on the insurance company, that changes the game altogether for the insurance company. And people say, why? I'll tell you why. Because when you appeal those denials, what happens is that the insurance company, the same, the same adjuster or a team of adjusters that have been looking at your claim, simply reevaluate whatever you've given them again and decide if to do a check mark, you know, on the box that says allow, all right, allow the appeal or deny the appeal. And most of the time, it's just very easy to just say deny the appeal. When we start a legal process, the whole thing changes. The claim now goes from that initial adjuster to a litigation adjuster, an adjuster whose job it is to try and resolve these kinds of claims. And they have a defense lawyer that's appointed, either an in-house defense lawyer, somebody on their payroll, or a lawyer like myself in a different firm. Either way, now that we started the legal process, the insurance company is essentially bleeding money because they have to defend your case legally. And they understand that eventually it's not them who makes the ultimate choice as to whether or not you're going to be getting money. It's potentially a judge. Now, why do insurance companies settle? Because they understand that it's much better for them to come to a resolution with us, some kind of a settlement, an out-of-court settlement, than take their chances in court where they can potentially get hammered for a ton more money than otherwise they could end up paying in a settlement, right? It's that certainty. So that's why I say to people, just like this lady here, you need to reach out to us. We will give you the information you need. We will talk to you about your case. It's going to cost you nothing, absolutely nothing, zero, zero cents to speak with us, and you'll get the right answers and direction on what you can and cannot do. Short break, and when we come back, chronic pain and LTD claims. That is on the way. Disability Law Show. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for-cause terminations are false, and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just going to walk away. Your insurer may ignore you. They may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks' pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. This is a Disability Law Show. John Scholes here and Savannah Tamarkin is there. We want to talk about chronic pain and disability claims, LTD claims. Now, from a legal point of view, legal point of view, Savannah, what is chronic pain? Well, chronic pain, John, legally and medically, really, is pain that simply is continuous. Despite medications, treatments, it's just something that uh, bothers you, whether it's back pain or neck pain or any other kind of pain. Uh, it's essentially pain that does not go away for a prolonged period of time. It doesn't mean it's permanent, but it means it's chronic. It, it's not something that, you know, you hit uh, you know, your foot against a table and you have pain for a few minutes. We're talking about something that usually lasts for months, if not years. Insurance companies, incidentally, John, uh, oftentimes cast doubt on chronic pain. We're going to talk about that uh, because of, you know, the definition of chronic pain and who assesses chronic pain and who diagnoses chronic pain. But what people need to understand is that, you know, chronic pain is just a label here. What we look for is we look at the symptoms, we look at how it affects functionality at work, and, and that all plays into the analysis as to whether or not you know, from a long-term disability perspective, chronic pain is, is a type of thing that uh, entitles somebody to, to LTD. Well, that makes the second question just that much more obvious, right? So why do LTD insurers deny claims for chronic pain? Well, if you think, if you, think uh, you know, uh, uh, about what LTD insurers would like to do, they would like not to pay you uh, long-term disability benefits. They would like to stop paying you if they've already been paying you for a certain period of time. So when they hear the phrase or the label chronic pain, to them, it translates into a lot of money, a lot of money they have to pay you, a lot of money maybe that they've already paid you, a lot of money that they're going to have to continue paying you. And so they start casting doubt on it early on, in my experience. They question your doctors. They sometimes have you seen by, by their own doctors. 
uh, you know, who say that this pain should have already resolved. I see this quite a lot. That's actually quite interesting to me. When a person is suffering from chronic pain, let's say sciatica or fibromyalgia or some other chronic pain, chronic condition, and the insurance company says, hmm, according to research and statistics, your pain should have resolved within three or four months, but it hasn't. You've been living with this for four months or for five months or for a year or for three years and your doctors confirm that you have chronic pain. Again, insurance companies, when they hear chronic pain, they hear money, right? They hear ka-ching, ka-ching. They don't like that. And so it's very, very important here that you provide the you know, continuous medical records and updated reports to the insurance company to continue explaining, not explaining, but to continue to confirm that you are in fact suffering from chronic pain that disables you from working. So how do you, moving forward, sort of orchestrate a successful claim for chronic pain? If you're a sufferer, yeah, you have to make sure it's documented. You have to make sure that right. you know you keep in touch with your doctor. You have to get treatments. Right, chronic pain usually uh, is followed by various treatment recommendations. It could be through physiotherapy, medication. There's a whole gamut of treatments. So it's really key here to show number one uh, that you are going to a doctor or doctors. And there are doctors, by the way, John, that specialize in chronic pain. Right, I'm not talking about necessarily neurologists or physiatrists. They're chronic pain doctors. Uh, I actually have a friend who's a chronic pain doctor, and, and that's what he does. He deals with chronic pain. He provides injections, uh, you know, for people, you know, to alleviate the pain, which is unfortunately temporarily only. But you want to make sure that you have doctors you go to regularly uh, f for treatments. You want to make sure that you follow your treatment recommendations or the recommendations by your doctors, and you want to make sure that you continue providing medical updates about your chronic pain status and how it continues to disable you from working to the insurance company. If you do all of that, it makes it very, very hard for the insurance company to take the position that you're not disabled from working and to stop your benefits. I'm not saying they don't do that. They do. They try and find every excuse to cut you off. But if you do all those three things, right, this constant communication with your doctors, following recommendations, and giving updates to your insurance company on a regular basis, your chances of getting cut off LTD go down significantly. So if you've made this claim, it's not happening, you've been denied, what do you do? Appeal? He says, you contact us. You do not appeal. <laughs> yeah, 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 appeal, sure. No, no, listen, you know what, John? Appealing a long-term disability denial is like appealing to your body to stop aching. It's just not going to happen, right? You got to take action. You got to do something that really, you know, forces the insurance company to, to, to you know, pay you what you're owed. And, and unfortunately, the only way to do that is to get the legal advice that you need. Now, you can try and do it yourself. You can try and appeal. You can try and uh, you know, just give it some time. Maybe the insurance company will come to their senses. They won't. They won't. Once they cut you off benefits, once they deny your claim on their computer system, your claim is closed. So the only way to hit them over the head, to force them to pay you what you're owed, is through the legal process. And that's just been something that we've realized over the years. This is what we do. Remember, we are a team of lawyers. That's all we do in my group. We deal with long-term disability denial, long-term disability cutoffs. And, and the thing is this, and I think most people don't realize this, it's actually a lot uh, easier to resolve many of these cases than people think. It it's doesn't take a long time uh, for, for most cases. I mean, every case is different, obviously. But in most cases, we resolve it within weeks or months of being retained and we resolve it for a significant amount of money that's owed to our clients. So again, don't walk away from your rights. Don't try to take on the insurance company yourself. And for God's sakes, do not appeal these denials. You're going to get nowhere. Coming up here, my insurer says I can do sedentary work. How do you handle that one? We'll tackle that after a short break. In the meantime, 1-855-821-5900. Email address help at disabilityrights.ca. Coming right back. People think their employer can make changes to their job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Your employer can't change your pay, hours, or duties. You may be entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Can insurance companies deny long-term disability claims for mental illness? When you're suffering from a mental health disability, insurance companies just don't understand. But we do. They can absolutely not force you back to work. If your doctors say you are not ready and you know you're not ready, they cannot make you go back to work. If you have a mental health disability and your claim is denied, don't give up. Give us a call and let us fight for you. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. 
people think you should go to the government to get severance pay. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Government can only help you get minimum severance, but not everything you're entitled to. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. You're watching the Disability Law Show. There's many ways to contact uh, Savannah and Savannah's team anytime. 1-855-821-5900 is one way. Another way is mydisabilityquestions.com. That is a resource for you to ask your questions. Anonymous, leave them there. They will be answered if they have been answered before. You can search the database and look for a question that is either just like or similar to yours and uh, read the answer before you carry on. This one, uh, Savan from Patrick, mydisabilityquestions.com. Patrick says, I was on long-term disability after multiple surgeries on my kidneys, which left me with residual pain in my back, which has become chronic. My doctors confirmed that uh, while I could perform basic daily activities, I wasn't able to sustain a full-time job. After numerous calls from my adjuster, they decided to cut off my LTD, saying I could do sedentary work. Can they do this? I remember this question, uh, John, and this is, this is interesting because there's a nuance here, and I bet you many disability lawyers will actually miss the nuance. So let's go back to basics. In order to qualify for long-term disability, you have to demonstrate that you cannot do the essential tasks of your own occupation for the first two years. Beyond two years, the test is you cannot do any occupation for which you are suited for by training, education, or experience. Essentially, the test is can you earn about 60 to 65 percent of your pre-disability income? at that two-year mark. If you can, well, then you likely do not qualify for LTD beyond the two-year mark. So what's happening here with Patrick? Well, this is interesting. The insurance company is not arguing that he can perform the essential tasks of any occupation. They're simply saying he can do a sedentary type job, but that's not the test. The test is not whether Patrick can do some other job, a sedentary job, at that two-year mark, or at any point for that matter, right? We have to look at the language of the policy. And the reason why this is important for, for, for you know, our audience here, John, is because insurance companies will use any excuse they can find to cut people off or to deny their claims. And in many instances, you need to be a disability lawyer or somebody who has a focus in their practice on this kind of law to understand the garbage that insurance companies are spewing out. Because when you are like Patrick and you get a letter that says, oh, you can do a sanitary type job, so therefore you don't qualify for LTD, you may think that that's an official line. You may think that somehow in your policy it states that if you can do sedentary type work, that disentitles you from LTD. No LTD policy says that. It just doesn't. And so I think that the lesson here, what people should draw from this is that it, it don't simply assume that what the insurance adjuster is telling you is correct. So in Patrick's case, what he could have done before emailing us or before posting his question on mydisabilityquestions.com, I mean, I'm glad he did, but we could do or what our viewers can do if they're in that situation is turn back to the adjuster and say, hey, adjuster, show me where in my policy it says that if I can do a sedentary type job, I'm not entitled to LTD anymore. And guess what? The insurance company will not be able to find that provision. And if that provision is not in your policy, they cannot cut off your benefits. So very important to understand uh, what, what the requirements are for you to get LTD and at what points or in what situations the insurance company is entitled to stop your LTD. Yeah. Don't, again, don't assume that the insurance company is correct when they're stopping your LTD because in many cases they're not if you remain disabled from working. Got some time to grab, a, grab an email here, Savannah. Again, help at disabilityrights.ca is how you reach out in that regard. This one from Camilla. Camilla writes in, says, I stopped working after receiving a cancer diagnosis. Along with depression, I have a hard time standing and walking. I received a letter from my insurer after nine months on LTD and CPP stating that my benefits will be cut off as my doctor refuses to provide a report on my health issues. My physician has provided a letter with relevant medical information. Despite this, the adjuster keeps hounding me for more information. Is this normal? Camille, this is really, really unfortunate. And John, it, my blood boils when I hear that somebody who has cancer that has to deal with the insurance company on top of everything else. Camille, no, it, it, it's not right. And look, I've always said insurance companies are entitled to updated medical information. But it, it, there is a limit to that. They can't ask you for information every single day. They can't hound your doctors and, and make it impossible for the doctor to essentially practice medicine. And, and look, for the most part, insurance companies are fairly reasonable when they ask for medical updates. 
But sometimes I do see overjealous adjusters who are simply asking for more and more and more information, even though they have everything they need. And, and then I get complaints, by the way, from doctors, uh, not complaints against me, but doctors who see the show or hear us on the radio and then contact me and say, what do I do in this situation? I've told the insurance company everything they needed to know about my patient, and they're still bothering me. I don't know what to do. Look, in those situations, we have to intervene. We have to communicate to the insurance company that this is not appropriate. We have, we have to communicate to the insurance company that if they continue harassing the individual, they're potentially exposing the insurance company to a bad faith claim here. No adjuster is going to want that. Uh, you know, they have to explain to their supervisors why, because of their conduct, they've now attracted a bad faith claim against the insurance company. That adjuster is not going to have a fun discussion with their manager or supervisor. So in Camilla's situation here, here's what I can tell you, Camilla. If your doctor has given the insurance company, your adjuster, the information you believe and your doctor believes is sufficient to confirm that you continue to be disabled because of your condition, then that's that. Then you confirm that by email with the adjuster, and if the adjuster tells you it's not enough and they're going to cut you off, you tell me immediately. I will step in personally, and I will deal with that adjuster and that insurance company. You will not be left to deal with this on your own on top of everything else that you're dealing with. I want to slide back over quickly to mydisabilityquestions.com, Savannah. An interesting one came in from Luis. says, uh, what is the any occupation period? Does that mean if you can do any occupation, you don't qualify for benefits anymore? No, and this is an excellent, excellent question. Uh, because, John, that's often what's confusing to people when they say, okay, the two-year mark, after I've been on LTD for two years, the test is now, you know, can I do the essential tasks of any occupation? And I say, no, there's a second part to, you know, to that test. It's any occupation for which you're suited for by training, education, or experience. You know, so if you are, I don't know, a graphic design artist that's making 200 grand a year, okay, you have a phenomenal job, and, and you know, you cannot do your job because of whatever is, is making you sick, the insurance company can't come to you at a two-year mark and say, we want you to work at Tim Hortons, you know, for 15 bucks an hour. They, they, they can't do that. That's not the way that the test works. Okay? Or, or the other example I give, John, is you, know, you have an orthopedic surgeon that's injured uh, you know, their hands. That person, for the first two years, cannot do surgery, so therefore they satisfy the test of, of own occupation because they can't do surgery. But if at that point, after the two-year mark, they can get a job teaching surgery where they don't have to operate, well, at that point, the insurance company would be correct in saying you don't qualify potentially uh, for LTD beyond two years because you can do a job for which you're suited for or for which you train for, you have experience in, right, as, as, as a teacher of surgery. Uh, but it's really important to understand that any occupation doesn't mean any occupation, period. It means any occupation for which you're suited for. And when people ask, what does that mean? I say, well, look, it's a nuanced analysis, but if you just want a general benchmark, the question is this. Can you, at the two-year mark, get a job or an occupation? Can you work in an occupation where you can earn 60 to 65% of your pre-disability income? If the answer is yes, then it's possible that the insurance company is correct in ending your benefit. If the answer is no, well, then they are not correct in ending your benefits, and you are entitled to LTD beyond the two-year mark, and we can help you get that. Is that 65% number? Is that because that's generally what you'll get for LTD, so they're trying to match it up with earnings moving forward? Uh, I, I think it's possible that that's what it is. I mean, that's what the yeah. courts have sort of told us, right? And again, but again, remember, John, it's very nuanced. It really depends on case by case. Yeah. We've had cases where the courts have said 70%. We have cases where the courts said 60%. So it really does depend. But the point is this. You, you're not obligated to take you know, a, a job that's going to pay you 20% of what you earn pre-disability. Yeah. Okay? Very important yeah. to understand. But if you have questions, just contact us. You bet. That was MyDisabilityQuestions.com. Again, it's a wonderful resource for you to ask your questions anytime. It's uh, free, it's anonymous, and there's a searchable database as well. The phone number, 1-855-821-5900 and DisabilityRights.ca. Catch our radio show from that website as well. We'll talk to you again. Disability Law Show. People think you have to sign back a severance offer by a deadline. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Deadlines are used as a pressure tactic. Make sure the offer is fair before you sign. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca.